Hey, all right. So this is lecture four, and I just want to first um, just give a shout out. Thank Tim for um, walking guys through some of what to expect on the summaries and exams and all that. So as you probably know, we're going to launch um, exam two. It's going to become available immediately after lecture day, and I'd like you to. Oh, I'm sorry. Exam one on chapters one and two. <laughs> I'm going to have ourselves. Yeah. I'm, think, I'm thinking chapter two in my head, but uh, exam one, which will cover um, chap chapters one and two. And um, before we hop right into it, though, I just wanted to mention that the reason I was late to lecture today, I was just at a little uh, conference downtown. We're, we're fortunate enough here in, in Missoula uh, to have the headquarters of the, of the Montana World Affairs Council, and their motto is bringing the world to Montana and bringing Montana to the world. And I, I think as we'll actually read through this chapter here, we'll see um, what a role Montana actually plays in primary energy uh, sources for, for the world. Um, and I was also fortunate enough to meet with the um, director of this nonprofit, uh, EcoViva, and they're putting into practice in Central America, you know, really a lot of the same uh, concepts that we cover here in renewable energy technology. How do you um, uh, provide economic opportunities for people? Um, how do you um, provide a high quality of living by providing enough energy without um, wrecking the place. So one, one example he gave was this uh, practice of dynamite fishing that they were using there and finding that it was not only harmful to uh, the biodiversity and the, and the ecosystem, but people were losing hands and, and things like that. So it was kind of a lose-lose across the board. And so what they were looking at were ways to just um, have people partner rather than competing for scarce resources. So that's that's a you know pretty good theme. And also, um, they are planning a trip to, um, I think, El Salvador in November. I signed my name up because it sounds like the organization works pretty closely with Engineers Without Borders. Engineers Without Borders will oftentimes provide technical expertise to um, impoverished countries. And so one of the examples they were showing there was um, using uh, solar, solar photovoltaic pumping systems. and. Um, we're also lucky enough to have one of our alums, Larry Kogue, started his own uh, solar water pumping outfit down in the Bitterroot uh, called Oasis Montana. So I'm, I'm certainly going to share these opportunities with Larry, and it could be that there are upcoming opportunities for um, students in the in the program to travel and, and uh, you know not only get good hands-on training, but um, you know see. Where, other part of the world and, and uh, you know get, get some experience so um, and then while I'm on that topic let me just hop in here 101 I was I was asked by uh, another organization here at the University of Montana to show you this slide there are some other upcoming study abroad opportunities the university is really trying to make a big push to branch out globally, you know, not only bring uh, international students here, but also send uh, Montana students abroad. So if you're available, this is happening this evening uh, from, from 4 to 5, if that's something uh, of interest. Okay, so let's hop into Chapter 2. Uh, chapter 2 is entitled Primary Energy, and um, off the top of your head, anybody, can anyone give me a definition for what primary energy is? From your from your reading, did you get an idea of what that is? It's uh, ground ground level energy where it, where it comes from. Part of it, I guess. Naturally occurring energy. I guess. Yeah, naturally occurring energy, ground level energy is another way to say it. Um, coal, and coal and natural gas are examples. Yeah, it's something that's sitting there readily available in nature to use or exploit, or how, however you want to look at it. Um, okay, so I'm just going to, I'm going to uh, cruise through the figures, um, and well, I think, it, I think it's also worth uh, mentioning a couple things before we get too, too deeply into the figures. Um, 
So I'm, and I'm just going to write it like this, primary energy. We're going to get into the laws of thermodynamics later, but the, the one we really need to keep in mind, first of all, and this is not only just mentally, but also in every single engineering problem you're going to solve, is that, um, so the, the first law is that energy uh, cannot be created or destroyed. And I think that's sitting, that's sitting right there in box 2.1. There's even some theories out there that um, the total amount of energy in the universe is zero. Uh, you know, based on some of the uh, discoveries in physics lately with dark energy, dark matter, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, obviously, what we observe right now is there's energy all around us, but as a sum total in the universe, there's actually no energy in the same sense that, in fact, there's really um, no Money, I mean, there's obviously an economy, but money is a uh, human-made convention and that um, it's, it's something we deal with and sort of agree upon. Energy is not the same thing. It's a, it's a physical object, but it could be that when you add up all the energies, it's zero um, or destroyed. And we'll get into this in a lot more detail. Um, but this will help as we move through. So one way of writing that is the... Um, the sum, so that's a sigma, sum of all energies uh, equals some constant. And we'll get into we'll get into kinetic potential, etc. Later on, uh, and it could be, and I'm just going to put a question mark equals zero. All right, so there's a deal there on energy arithmetic. Uh, the textbook mentions SI units which is what we will use. We've already looked at the units of the joule. Uh, the watt and the second. Off the top of your head, what's the relationship between joules, watts, and seconds, or energy, power, and time? Quick little math math primer. Just, I'll give you three choices, multiple choice, and, th and and this is another way to think through almost any math problem. So we can have energy equals power times time. We can have power equals energy times time, or we can have time equals power times energy. Multiple choice. Um, who, who says the first choice? All right, I got zero vo votes for the first one. Um, who says the second one? We got one, one, two, three votes. How about the third? Zero. Okay. <laughs> well, um, so we will dig into this more deeply. You're not going to need to know it for the first exam, but as it turns out, um, this is the uh, this is the correct relationship between power, energy, and time. And so, as it turns out, um, one joule equals one watt times one second. So we've already talked about what a joule is. We've gone through the megajoules, et cetera, et cetera. We haven't delved that much into power. Um, I think we all kind of know what time is. But the way to think about this is um, energy is sort of like um, your bank, right? And power is analogous to your uh, spending rate. So let me just say that again. So joules or, or energy is like your, your bank, which, which you've got stored, and power, which is measuring watts, is your spending rate. And so you can think of power a little bit like um, miles per hour, and you think of joules as more like miles driven. You can also think of joules as like the amount of gasoline in your tank, and you can think of watts as like your uh, miles per gallon. So that's, and, and that's, that's fundamental. I mean, we're going we're gonna to hit this just about every single lecture. But that's your fundamental equation and your relationship between energy, power, and time. Okay. So we covered SI units. Table 2.1 covers prefixes. There will be a question 
on exam one about the information in, in table 2.1. So you're going to want to know your kilos, your megas, your x's, your gigas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, you can make up a, a funny little acronym for it if you want to, but most of it's pretty straightforward, especially if you're thinking about computers and you get up into uh, terabytes. We've talked a little bit about petajoules already. We've talked a little bit about exajoules. We know that um, primary energy consumption on planet Earth right now stands at 500 exajoules, 500 times 10 to the 18th joules. Um, box 2.3, let me hit that one briefly too. We know, and it, even it says right there, one, one watt equals one joule per second. Um, it's also critical to know that one kilowatt hour equals 3.6 megajoules. And the way, the, way that's, um, the way that's derived is just to know that if you've got um, Well, is to know that one uh, watt, uh, again, equals, equals one joule per second. So one joule equals uh, one watt times one second. So what would a joule hour be? So if I'm going to, if I'm going to, if I'm going to, um, yeah, so if, if I had one, um, Right, so what I'm going to do here is just what, like we've done before and say in um, uh, rather than, well, so let's just write it out. One joule hour equals, again, one watt. And this is just a matter of how, how, many, how many seconds in an hour, 3,600. Uh, 3,600. Seconds per hour. So one joule hour is um, 36, 3600 joules. Uh, 3600. Uh, one joule hour is. Uh, let me look at this. Uh, 3600 watt seconds. Okay, or. Um, 3.6 um, watt seconds. And then just and then you can see to get up to um, 3.6 megajoules, I would then, oh sorry, um, kilowatt seconds. And then to get up to one kilowatt hour, I'm going to multiply both sides by a thousand, so 1,000 times your 3.6 kilowatt seconds. Then I'll hop up to the next page here. Um, so I can just take that 1,000, combine it with the kilo, and now I get 1 kilowatt hour equals 3.6 megawatt seconds. A watt second is just a joule equals 3.6 um, megajoules. So what I've done there, last time I talked about every one of these problems, you're actually working three problems at once. One is just the arithmetic, the numbers themselves. The other one is keeping track of stuff like this, the thousands and the kilos together. Multiply those two guys together, what do I get? Well, I get my mega right there. And then the final thing is just keeping track of the units. A watt second is a joule. So there's always three problems going on behind the scenes. The arithmetic, in this case, it was, it was pretty simple, just multiplying 3,600 by one. That's the first thing you're keeping track of. The other thing, like I just mentioned, is the, the powers of 10 and their prefixes. That's all right there in table 2.1. And then the last thing is just keeping track of the units. And like I just, just got done saying, the, um, 
these these guys right here are, are going to be our bread and butter for the rest of the term, just knowing that energy is power times time and knowing that a joule is a watt second. If you got that, you, you just about have all the mathematics in this in this course licked. And so, like I said, we'll, we'll hammer that home uh, just about every day. All right. Um, one other thing to keep in mind here, so one uh, ton of oil equivalent equals 42 gigajoules. So in the back of your book, we've already explored some of the appendices showing uh, energy conversions. Uh, it, and in fact, in table A5, a, a version of this is, is given. So you can see that one ton of oil is 42,000 megajoules. It's the same exact thing that I just wrote on the, on the board. One ton of oil is 42 gigajoules. So that is how much energy is released when you burn one ton of oil. Okay. Now, to the chapter, to the figures. See how we are in time, but oh, we're doing fine. Okay, so what we're looking at here is some very, a very early energy technologist harvesting oil from some of the gushers that occurred near Titusville, Pennsylvania in the 1860s, 1870s. And you can see that um, uh, you've got a, you know, a relatively large uh, reservoir right here. The, the, in the very early days of early recovery, there was enough pressure on these wells. We even saw that recently with the, uh, the Gulf disaster. There's enough gravitational pressure of the Earth's crust pressing down on these oil reserves that if you pop it like a balloon, up comes the oil squirting, right? And that's basically what happened there in Titusville, Pennsylvania. And that's why they have, you know, fantastic access to these things. They could just kind of store it, store it in a bucket, drip it out like, like water. Uh, those days are gone. You know, those days are long gone. We just kind of like, uh, Jed clamp it, shooting it some whatever, you know, shooting it some food up from the ground, came some bubbling crude. I mean, that's basically what, what, what this is. Um, and so this, this oil uh, primarily would have been used for heating, uh, but then once uh, it was learned, well, and we'll, we'll get into transportation later, it took another 20, 30 years before um, oil was then refined into gasoline as a, as a transportation product. Um, but and it's also frequently looked to that the oil booms of the 1860s and 70s uh, had the effect of, of actually saving some whale species from extinction. Because it used to be that whales were a very rich source of oil for heating, lighting, etc. So once uh, this even more energy dense, less hazardous, I mean, these guys, you know, the, the whalers are out risking their lives, you know, capturing these large animals. In a lot of ways, this was a um, uh, save some of the whale species from extinction. All right, um, take a look. Oh, take a look at box 2.6. I want to hop back into that for a second. This is a number that fascinates me all the time. Um, world power. And I think we even did this little bit of math. But world power equals. 16 terawatts. And we did the math and, and figured out if you divide 16 terawatts by 7 billion people, you come up with um, something like on the order of 2 kilowatts per person. This 2 kilowatts per person means that each person on the planet has approximately 20 technological slaves working for him or her around the clock. 20 techno-slaves. Right now, I've got my uh, own little techno-slave computer working for me. We've got the uh, projector. Uh, shoot, I mean, the AC and the heat aren't running. Get your cell phone. But these are the things, these are the, um, the, the this is power that if, if you had to run it yourself and you have to be a, either a very wealthy or powerful person to have that many people at your disposal. Or 
um, if we were back sort of to horsepower, you'd need three horses kind of running 24-7 to, to run all your gadgets. So you can, you know, very quickly take those uh, 16 terawatts, convert that to two kilowatts per person. Some people might ask the question, was it, is it two kilowatts per day? Is it two kilowatts per year? No, it's just two kilowatts. That, that, that's how quickly we are consuming energy. We're converting primary energy into heat at a rate at, of 16 terawatts. Okay, so we just looked at oil a second ago. Here's an example of very early coal mining. Uh, as it turns out, the political instability in Russia and the Ukraine has actually see it, uh, forced uh, some folks back into this mode of coal mining. If, you, if you've looked at National Geographic recently, um, with a lot of the political oversight gone in some of these countries, people are um, taking out old bathtubs and running them down into abandoned mines and, and coming up with coal and just kind of selling it on, on a, well, the free market, if you will, that's resulted as a, uh, in, the, in the power vacuum in, the, in Russia and the Ukraine. Um, you can see why, you know, being this close to this technology might be hazardous to your health. I mean, there's all the same mercury, lead, sulfur emissions, et cetera, et cetera. It led to a lot of problems. This particular photo is from London. It led to a lot of smog problems in London, and we've, we've since, you know, fixed that to a large extent. Um, but now, as, we'll, as we see, uh, Beijing, uh, China, and a lot of other cities in China are dealing with the exact same problem of uh, coal emissions. All right. Um, oh, and there's a, there's a problem in box 2.8, which is almost identical to the problem that we saw previously. How many wind turbines would you have to put up to totally replace coal? And you can see they're coming up with um, numbers on the order of petajoules down there at the bottom. Um, you can also see that the book covers what a quad is. It's a quadrillion BTUs. A BTU is defined in the, in the chapter. You can also see that the calorie is defined versus the kilocalorie. Good to know that a kilocalorie obviously is a thousand calories, no, no secret there. Um, and again, all of this is summarized in, the, in your appendix in the back of your book. And I think we even did a little bit of uh, um, Excel tabulation uh, last time, didn't we make a little Excel table? So play around with these numbers. It's, it's the, rest, the rest of the semester is going to be based on being able to um, convert between these, these different uh, energy units. All right, so that's, that's 2.1. Now let's look into primary energy and where it goes. So if we start, and, and what they're, um, what these, what these two things are comparing, um, and rather than using megawatts, um, megajoules, kilowatt hours, et cetera, they're just gonna, just gonna say 100 units of electricity coming out. It could be a kilowatt hour, that's conventionally how electricity is measured. You can measure it in calories, you can measure it in therms, you can measure it in BTUs, whatever the heck you want. But the point is, in a combustion process, and this is, this is not, I mean, this is very surprising to most people who have, you know, dealt with it before. Um, in fact, I was just in a meeting with our very own Steve Running, who happens to have a, a Nobel Prize. He, sh he shared the Nobel Prize in 2004 or six, whenever it was, with Al Gore. Um, as he, was, he sits on the international panel of climate change, and he didn't, he didn't know these, these fundamental physics either. But you look at that and you say, gosh, why, you know, why out of that um, 260 units of fuel going in, why the heck did 20 just head up the, the stack in, in the combustion, and then why on earth would another 140 go out in um, turning a, a turbine? Well, that's the second law of thermodynamics. We'll get into it a little later, but it's not, it's not something you, you can negotiate. 
uh, it, it turns out that that's fundamental to, to how the universe works. And what these two figures are showing is that um, in a hydro system, which is shown at the bottom, you lose almost no energy because there's no, nothing's being set on fire. In order for these turbines to work, something has to get hot. As it, as it turns out, the hotter it gets, the more efficient it is, but there's always going to be waste, no, no matter what. And the, this is a little bit inaccurate. Um, no system is 100% efficient. Uh, so the actual number here is probably going to be closer to 104, 105, because there's always a little bit of wasted heat uh, in these systems. But that's just showing the comparison of two different primary energies. Where, and where are they coming from? And where did, where did, this, um, where did this top one um, come from? Probably fossil fuels. It could also be a nuclear power plant. It's a, it's a thermal power station. The nuclear power plant also has to get hot to work. But you're absolutely right. The fossil fuels are being dug out of the ground. They're not going back in. Same thing with the uranium. The plant's not making any more of it. Um, how about the bottom? Where's that coming from? Yeah, well, so that's, so that's driven by the sun. Uh, as we saw in the previous chapter, the sun's on 24-7, or at least on, on average, on the planet. And so that hydrologic cycle is driving that system on the bottom. And as you can see, uh, it, it's less wasteful. Obviously, you've got your environmental concerns, damming up rivers, ecosystems, et cetera, et cetera. But there's two direct comparisons of, of extracting primary energy and their relative efficiencies. All right, world primary energy sources. Uh, as we can see again, there's that 500 exajoules right at the bottom, and there's that uh, uh, 16 terawatts. And what you'll find, if you multiply uh, 16 terawatts by the number of seconds in a year, you're gonna get 502 exajoules. That's, that's that same equation we just looked at. Energy is power times time. Okay, so here's, here's where it is coming from, at least when the snapshot was taken six years ago. My estimate would be natural gas has, has crept up since then, and oil has probably crept down a little bit. Um, here's nuclear at 5.2, here's hydro at 2.3, here's traditional biomass, and you might say, oh, wait a second, where the heck is wind? Where the heck is solar? Well, it's that, it's that skinny little fraction right there. Um, it's it's uh, small but growing. Okay. And then there's another, if you look at table 2.2, you can see another uh, summary of what we're seeing here in this figure. All right. Now, again, here's world primary energy consumption by source, 1950 to 2009. The, the sum total is not here, but um, if you were to add up all these lines, this number of exajoules would in fact sum to 502 exajoules. I was astonished by this. As you're reading through the paper that I wrote for summary one, what you'll find, it was, it was astonishing, but that 200 megajoules per day that I just mentioned a couple slides ago, um, that's the global average. The United States of America was at 200 megajoules per day about right here. So uh, between 1950 and now, we have, on a per capita basis, increased our energy consumption by a factor of six. And you might say, that's crazy, but you look at how much we drive, how much we fly, all of our gadgets, it's, it's the reality. And I don't know why, I don't know why hydro kind of took a dip right there. That's a little bit surprising to me. I don't know if those are dams coming offline or not, but um, there it is. I, I do know that nuclear kind of peaked a little while ago too. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's natural gas. Is it my, my, my bad. Yeah, sorry. Hydro is way down here. Natural gas. Um, and again, if we were to take this out to 2015, I think we're going to find that that, that uh, swings up significantly. Yeah, thanks for that correction. That, that's, that's why. <laughs> yeah, I don't think hydro is really 
going away? Answered my question. <clears throat> All right. Well, so he might have got a dead pool. Say again? It might have got a dead pool in some of the rest of the words. What, uh, I'm, not go away. I'm not familiar with that debt. That That's when the level of the reservoir isn't high enough. To oh, generate. right, yeah, yeah. I, I think we might find in some places where you are experiencing drought that um, hydro might go down in, in, in some locations. No, it's a good point, yeah. yeah. Well, I think the other thing you'll notice is in these, in these graphs, um, tidal is not mentioned, uh, wave energy is not mentioned, so. Well, is that is that still considered hydro? If it's no, it's not. It's no, not. We, uh, wave wave and tidal are not hydro. Hydro is just just building a dam somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it has, it has to do with water, but it's not everything. It's right. All the water. yeah, exactly. The hyd the hydro is just based on the the evaporation cycle. Turbo. Yeah. Turbo. Whereas whereas the wave uh, wave tech is going to okay. be more wind based, and then. Um, Title is, of course, gravitational based. Yeah, yeah. Good question. All right. Um, I don't have I don't have a copy of 2.3, but take a look at Table 2.3, and you can you can look and see that, for example, very top line, the wealthiest countries are producing 31 percent of the world's energy and consuming. 41%. So the wealthiest companies, countries obviously can afford, you know, financially to be net importers of energy. And there's a few um, examples. The USA and Canada together consume over a fifth of the world's energy. Uh, China is right around 20%. I think by now those, those numbers might have flipped. You know, it, it could be that China is now consuming more energy than we are. Um, the, other, the other factor, you can look at GDP, uh, U.S. and Canada are by far the wealthiest. China is uh, quite far behind in these numbers, but catching up uh, relatively quickly. Um, the other one is primary energy consumption per capita as a multiple of world average. I don't see the number one on there anywhere, but you can see that China at 1.1 the average Chinese person is about the average human on the planet. And um, nobody wants to be average. You know, I'm, I'm sure Kenya down there at the bottom would, would love to be above average, but uh, that's just kind of kind of where they are. Yeah, yeah, nobody wants to be average. Yeah. So those are, those, are the, those are the big numbers. That's pretty crazy, though, if China is <coughs> uses less energy than us, and they have a lot more people. Yeah, and that's, well, um, that's right. That's exactly right. So China has about triple our population, but uses about the same amount of energy. Uh, it's not, not penciling out all that well, because if you look at primary energy consumption, it looks like we're at four times on a per capita basis. Well, that, that just means that their, their population is closer to four times our population. Okay, now, this, this figure, we're, what we're looking at is world annual oil production and, and the price, and they're not that well correlated. <laughs> so it's not strictly a supply and demand thing. There's all kinds of manipulations, cartels, embargoes, wars, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, so the, the, you know, your standard supply and demand uh, model does not necessarily uh, follow here. All right, I'm going to take a oh, see, we got one more. Yeah, so we got through 2.5. I'm going to take a quick break and then we'll, we'll finish off the chapter. <laughs>